tell you, I have to admit, it is kind of weird not having the choir here because I'm used to listening to the bass parts. So that way I can join in on singing the hymns. And I couldn't hear the bass part this morning. So I'm looking forward to next Sunday when the choir is back up. This morning's scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. And it can be found on pages uh, 1645 and 1646 in your pew Bible. And as I'm realizing that I forgot to put my bookmark in today's reading, I will also remind you that, yes, this is a passage that I am sure all of us are very familiar with, but I would challenge us to try to listen to it anew and try to pick up uh, some new item that you might have missed earlier in your previous readings. Listen to the word of the Lord as it is found in John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without, made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the life of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The word has become flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he who, uh, whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has been made known through him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. For those of you who came here this morning anticipating hearing a sermon about the three magi who, made, who saw a star and then made a trip to Bethlehem, and then having me go and tell you how uh, we three kings is not biblically correct, I apologize to disappoint you. The Revised Common Lectionary reserves that gospel passage from Matthew for tomorrow, the actual day of Epiphany. Today's gospel reading in the lectionary is John's prologue that I just read. 
With John's prologue, we get to answer the musical question that we sang in our last hymn. What child is this? The first line of John's prologue might cause us to flash back to the very first phrase in the Bible. John declares, in the beginning, just like Genesis 1-1 does. But instead of continuing with God created like Genesis, the evangelist says, in the beginning was the Word. And he goes on to say, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then jumping down to verse 14, and I know I normally don't jump down verses, but today it just made sense to do it. Jumping down to verse 14, John informs us that the Word became flesh, and furthermore, that the world came and dwelled with humanity as the only begotten of God. While John does not go into the story of the Immaculate Conception like Luke and Matthew do, we know that by saying that the Word was the only begotten of God, the writer is definitely referring to Jesus Christ. With Jesus being the Word, and the Word being God, John is making a very important theological point here. Whatever we can say about God the Father is also true about Jesus. And whatever we can say about Jesus can be said about God the Father. As Jesus will declare in John chapter 8, verses 24, 25, and then again in verse 58, he is the I am. The I am, for those of you who are not familiar with Old Testament, is the title that God the Father uses when Moses asked God at the burning bush, who should I say sent me if the slaves in Egypt should ask? To claim that I am is to claim that you are God. Already in the first verse of John's prologue, we see a couple of areas that people can and do fall into heretical uh, beliefs. The first heresy can be seeing God, the Word, as God and the Word as separate gods. Christianity staunchly affirms what God says about himself in the Shema found in Deuteronomy 6, where it reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. To explain how Christianity is not a polytheistic religion, we have the doctrine of the Trinity where we claim that God is three persons known as God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But those three people are one God. While talking about the Trinity, we can come into the second major heresy, and I must confess, seminary cleared me of that heresy because for a while, I sort of thought that this is how we could see the uh, Trinity. The heresy is known as modalism. And in modalism, you say, well, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are merely three titles for the same being. For example, my children refer to me as pastor, or to as father. My mom refers to me as son, and you, the congregation, refer to me as pastor. Three separate titles, all of them applying to the same person. The problem with that is that in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit 
are three separate persons, but at the same time, one God. Then in verse 3, we return to the creation story. John tells us that the Word, Jesus, created everything. Then, just in case you were speed reading through that portion and missed it, John rephrases what he says by saying that from him, nothing was made which has not come into being. Verse 4 then wraps up the creation aspect of Christ by saying that Christ was the light, and the light was the light of men. Then we get to verse 5. And with verse 5, we get to have a little translational issue translating the Greek into English. The first part of verse 5 is very straightforward and simple. The light shines into the darkness. The world we live in has been darkened by our sinful nature. John is telling us that the Word shines the light into our darkness. So far, so good. The translational issue comes in the second part of the verse. The Greek declares that the darkness has not, and it uses the word kataleben, the light. Well, what is kataleben? Well, kataleben can be either overcoming something, or understanding something. So the question is, when John says that the world has not catalabined the light, is this. Is John saying that the world has not been able to defeat the light? Or that the world has not been able to understand the light? Both meanings make perfect sense in the context that John is writing here. So I decided to do a little bit of searching. I have a computer program that I have six different English translations flashing up on the same verse. So I looked at those six translations, and guess what? Three of them say that the world has not defeated or overtaken the light, and the other three said that the world has not understood the light. I guess as pastor, I'm the tie-breaking vote in this situation. And what I've decided to do is I think this is a case where John purposely used that word with two meanings because he wanted both meanings to be understood. If I'm correct in this theory, we can say that the darkness has not understood nor has it defeated the light, and both would be absolutely true. Then in verses 10 and 11, John declares that the Word came into the world, and remember in verse 14, John tells us that he came into the world in human flesh, but that the world did not know him, nor received him. Just as we celebrated at our Christmas Eve service a little more than a week ago, the Word came to his own chosen people, Israel, but even God's people did not recognize him. Why didn't the world, and especially his own people, not recognize him? It goes back to our sin nature. In chapter 3 of John's Gospel, we see the story of Jesus meeting Nicodemus. In verse 19 of chapter 3, we see that even though the light came into the world, we preferred the darkness because our ways are evil. Obviously, if we are not doing right, 
We definitely don't want the light shining brightly on our sinful ways. Well, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1 is a sad commentary on our society. Verse 12 does give us a little bit of hope. There are some in society who will comprehend the light and will not fight against it. Notice John declares that to those who receive him, in other words, to those who believe in Christ, we receive the authority to become children of God. I want to point out something that in my many years of reading chapter 1, I missed until just about 10 days ago when I was going through the Greek here. God creates all of us. We understand that God loves all of us. But notice what John is saying in verse 12 concerning how we become children of God. What is needed to be a child of God? John answers that question by saying, we need to believe in Jesus' name. John then continues to dispel the thought that we, in our own ability, are able to obtain child of God status when he declares that it is not through blood nor the will of our flesh that this can occur, but it occurs through our being born of God. Verse 16 continues with the statement that from the world, in other words, from Christ, we have received grace upon grace. The light who is shining in the darkness, who became human flesh, who was rejected by his own creation, is the method through which we will receive the grace to become children of God. While we have touched on this briefly earlier, I want to circle back one more time to verse 14. It is very important in Orthodox Christianity that Christ's humanity be recognized. The Word came down to earth in human flesh and dwelt among us. While Christ was tempted in every way that we are, he was sinless. If Christ did not die a human death, then Christ's death was to no avail. We would not be able to receive a pardon for our sins. It is important that we reject the idea that Jesus came to earth only appearing to be God, or appearing to be human. Christ, as Paul states in Philippians chapter 2, came down from heaven and became human. As we conclude this message, I want to review what John declares in his prologue. First, Christ the Word was existed before even the creation of the world. The world and all that is in it owes its being to the Word. Next, the Word became flesh and dwelled among us. Though Christ came to his own and shone his light to us, the world as a whole rejected the light. Yet to those of us who believe in his name, we are given the authority to become children of God. In a few moments, we will commemorate what Jesus did for us while he was here in the flesh to enable us to be found with his righteousness before the Heavenly Father. Normally at the beginning of a communion service, 
we recite the Apostles' Creed. Many of us have even memorized it. However, this morning, I am choosing to open the communion service with the Nicene Creed. The main reason why I chose that creed is that it touches on many of the points mentioned in this morning's scripture passage. As we close this message, let us be among those who actually comprehend the light that is shining into our darkness. <clears throat> then, let us become that beacon on a hill, shining the light that Jesus is shining into our own dark world. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> we have now reached the time of the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. And just before coming up, I was given an update on Vicki Stallings. She has returned to the hospital in Loveland because the infection is not improving and will be staying in Loveland until the infection is uh, totally defeated. And so let's keep Vicki and her family in our prayers as we uh, pray this morning. Any other prayer requests or praises? Susan. Pastor, I'd like early travel mercy prayers for Cameron and his group. They'll be leaving next Sunday. Okay, travel mercies for the C4 group that's going <coughs> to West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach this time. Thank you. And prayers that God blesses their ministry to the people there. Any others? Sandy. Healing prayers for teens who's going undergoing shoulder surgery on Wednesday. Okay. Teens going under the knife on Wednesday. And will that be in Laramie or Fort Collins? Fort Collins. Okay, well, uh, our, maybe we need to hold our work.